I'm John Bowden. We're up to our full interview. This is our second chat with Toto's David Page, who's still the musical director of the band. But in this long clip, which is over an hour, we cover a lot of ground. The fact that Toto will not be releasing any new music under the Toto banner for the foreseeable future, his work with Steely Dan, how they went into the second album in 1979 with a lot of confidence. He talks about working with Joe Cocker, the tragic story of... Derek and the Domino, Steely Dan drummer Jim Gordon. Lots of Elton John talk on here, the Doobie Brothers. A special thing that Michael Jackson told all the musicians in the studio. We look at his lifelong friendship with Steve Lukather. One artist that David Page would never say no to, even if he was in retirement. More talk on the seventh one, Total Four, the Grammys. His greatest memory of late great band member Jeff Porcaro and Mike Porcaro. And having to replace Bobby Kimball after winning all those Grammys on Total Four. Enjoy our entire chat with the maestro himself, David Page. I'm John Bowden. This is Rock History Book. G'day, sir. How you been? How are you, John? Uh, I'm glad we're able to work this out and everything like that. I love your I love your background right there. I see some CDs and I see a I actually see a reel to reel tape recorder back yeah, there. Yeah, that's a TAC. I've got a Studer. Uh, yeah, an eight eight nine eight oh five a eight oh five. I think it's a very famous Studer. Uh, yeah, but- right. But no one wants it because it weighs 100 pounds and it's... I know. I know. Anyway. Um, so let's start with, let's start with Christmas. I've asked every, you know, I don't ever do it in June because people look at me like they want to kill me. But but right. what was Christmas like for you, the holidays like for you when you were a kid? And, and what are you expecting this year? Uh, Christmas was great when I was a kid. We had a tree and we had presents under the tree and... Uh, I'll never forget the year I was, I think I was uh, eight years old when I got a, a, a Schwinn bicycle. And that was just a, with a handlebars, butterfly handlebars. And that was just the biggest deal to me in the world. I couldn't believe it, you know. With That's the banana seat? It. The banana seat? Huh? Did you, you have the banana, banana seat? And, uh, <laughs> And that's when I knew Santa existed because I couldn't figure out how that bike got in there, that our living room. You know what I mean? For uh, So I knew there was a Santa Claus. And, uh, uh, this year, I'm uh, hoping that I get an e-bike from Santa. You know, me and my wife are looking to get go e-biking. You know, so uh, uh, hopefully Santa will be able to fit that down the chimney. By the way, uh, Steve had said, Luke said in an interview, so I didn't see it, but that that any new music coming out will not be Toto music; it'll just be solo music. Yeah, for right now, yeah, we're kind of at a, on a hiatus from Toto music. We're doing because everybody's just involved in their own thing, you know. Uh, Steve Steve was doing a solo record, then Luke, Joe started doing one at the same time, and then they called me and said, "You got to do one. You got to do the solo record here." So I said, "Go, go, gee, you know what I mean? Uh, I don't. I'm not really a, a solo artist here." And they said, well, "Yes, you are. You can do this." So I put one out too, you know. And uh, 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 we just thought by Let's let's just cross pollinate these records here, and maybe people will enjoy a little bit of Toto music there. You know, you get more, you get more music. Yeah, yeah. By the way, the biggest question that I got when I asked people on YouTube and the Facebook groups uh, that I belong that I own was, having said what you just said, will there be more solo music from you? Uh that's a good question. I'm not sure if I'm going to continue doing solo stuff. Or not? Uh, hopefully, hopefully, yes. The answer is yes. Hopefully, you know what I mean. Uh, it took me a while to get that one out. So uh, uh, I'm, I'm just, I'm always making music. I have a recording studio in my house here. I'm always tinkering around. So uh, I'm sure something will hit me. Sometime will hit me where I go. You know what? I should put these out here. You know, yes. and uh, so I'll be working. I'll be working on it always. You know. I find that the Toto fans who have, you know, welcomed me in really well as yeah. far as covering you guys, which was nice. Yeah. But anyway, uh, they, they're a different breed. They're the most uh, loyal people that I've ever run into through talking to all the different rockers about their fans. The Toto fans, they're there, man. They're there for you. They are. They're so loyal and, and it means so much to us. We're so grateful and we're so blessed that we have fans that are loyal and been keeping us going all these years, you know. And uh, it's it would make it's the real reward is to go out when you go touring and you keep seeing these familiar faces that have been there for years have just keep coming back and keep coming back 
and it's almost like a one, one big family, you know. So it's very uh, uh, total is very global, and we have uh, fans all over the world and fans that travel from all over the world to see these concerts and stuff. So uh, 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 we're like I said, we're very grateful to our loyal fans. You know, uh, Michael Lomardian told me that, uh, and you probably know the story that the reason Christopher Cross didn't want to work with him for the solo album, but when he heard he had been on a Steely Dan album, which was one of Christopher Cross's favorite uh, bands, he said, "Come on in, produce my albums." What was what was that? Uh, what was your experience like? Like 1974, Pretzel Logic. Uh, Michael Lomardian was there. Uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, I have a bit utmost respect for Michael Lamardian. He's like my, one of my top five ultimate keyboard players, you know? So, uh, uh, I played on the Pretzel Logic album. I did Night by Night with Steely Dan. And of course, Martin did all the rest, you know, as well as Katie Light. I did, uh, uh, Black Friday and Dr. Wu on that album. And, um, and, uh, uh, I don't know if they, I think they were using Michael at that time. And uh, he was just, uh, uh, he was a great, uh, that was a great uh, uh, union, him and Christopher Cross together. I still like listening to those songs. Well, very well produced and very musical. And uh, and uh, you can really tell it's Michael Lombardian. I know that uh, Jeff and uh, Hungate and Lukather played on uh, several of those uh, uh, Christopher Cross things. So uh, we've been cross-pollinating here for a while here with uh between the uh, Doobies and uh, uh, Christopher Cross and Michael McDonald and uh, the West, the West Coast family, you know. By the way, uh, speaking of that, I remember when uh, uh, Michael McDonald was on one of your videos. And uh, did you like that process? Were, were you because I mean, you guys did big videos. I mean, the the the, the yeah. hold the line. That's a uh, not hold the line. Uh, uh, well, I remember the press stuff for hold the line. Yeah, right. Because um, that in Zellers. I walked in one day and I bought the album already and I'm going, there's this a little TV playing, you know, a little video. Sun. Yeah. All the videos. Yeah. yeah. Funny that we shot that video. That was that we did four videos for 25 grand at the whiskey go, go. Okay. Then those days, uh, it they didn't want any vignettes and stuff. Like we eventually started doing, they wanted just performance stuff performing. Well, we see how you, they wanted to know us as a live band. Because when we got signed, we had never played live for them. They signed us without even hearing us play. They just hear and heard our demos. So, uh, uh, yeah, uh, Toto. Uh, uh, those are just promotional videos. And they were they were demanded by everybody at the time. Now it's not. Now it's a little bit different thing. But uh, at did the you time, like the process? Did you like the process of doing videos? No, it's doing videos. It's a lot of waiting around. If you find it out when you're doing videos and stuff, it's hurry up and wait, you know. And uh, musicians like to be in the studio all the time. We always like to be booking dates. So, uh, 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 but I do. I found it. it I did. Uh, part of part of me found it very interesting because you're around camera people. You're around uh, people that have sh uh, in the uh, uh, film business. You know what I mean? With DPs and all that kind of stuff. And it's interesting to see their side of the. Uh, the camera, you know, you know, the girl who was in uh, the Pamela video, I was telling Joe, I looked her up. Uh, uh, it wasn't easy. Anyway, she uh, she became uh, 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 like this rich. Yeah, the main girl in Pamela, the, the, the girl that you guys concentrate, well, the director concentrated on the most. And you never met these people because that was done off. Yeah. I knew him. I knew Rosanna. I knew uh, Cindy Rhodes. Of course. Tubes, you know what I mean? And uh, she was uh, um, cast, like I said, we knew her from the tubes. And uh, 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 who's the guy that uh, directed Michael Jackson uh, album? Kenny Ortega yeah. directed that video. So and he's the best. I love Kenny Ortega. And uh, he did that, uh, Rosanna, with us. And uh, How long did that take, by the way? Sorry to interrupt uh, you, but that Rosanna video, I just watched it like two days ago for, for the first time in a while. How long did that take from your end? The video took our a day from our end. We came in and did two video two, two days with two videos. One was uh, Africa and one was Rosanna. 
you know, those are the days when you would fly in off of tour and the director would say, sit here and you're going to do this and this and this, where we didn't have that much input. You know, the only input I had was I had told uh, the director um, that I wanted to to, uh, to get the vibe of, of, of uh, West Side Story on Rosanna. So that's where you saw the chain link fence and the guys fighting. And it was a little bit over the top uh, when the uh, band saw the all the, the the guys practicing choreography out in the the the, the tarmac of A uh, and M Records, you know, it, everybody was kind of taken aback. Going, what did you get us into now? You know, so uh, I uh, uh, I I look upon that with fond memories. It's a great video, by the way. In the song Rosanna, what is that when it goes? Boop, 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 you know, there's a certain there's a, halfway through the song. I could hear, I remember thinking, was that a mistake? Oh, they probably meant to, come on, they meant to do that. But there's a part where it goes boop, 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 like that. Whoop, like, uh, yeah, that, I think that's me singing really high, doing a little bit of uh, my uh, uh, Al Green in there. I think that you're talking to that, about that part right there. Yeah, I, I, it didn't sound like a vocal to me, but it sounded like, and I remember going, I've always wanted to ask, and another thing, who says on Hydra? Who does choo cha in the beginning? Who, who that's, me. that's me. That's me. Choo cha. Yeah, that's me. Yeah, that's me. That was uh, you know we were we were kind of getting into prog uh, rock or at an early stage right there. You know uh, we were trying to be more progressive. We wanted to be a progressive pop band with an edge. You know what I mean? And uh, I thought Hydra was a very transformative album. You know what I mean? Where it showed our fans. Well, we aren't just about trying to make it singles and stuff like that. We're actually trying to do something uh, uh, that you should go see the live show to do, you know, because we had started touring by then. And uh, we saw all these other bands were, were getting into, I started writing, we started writing stuff for, uh, to be uh, performed live. So Hydra was a good example of that. Joe Cocker, what was that like? Uh, what Joe Cocker to you was? Yeah, Joe Cocker was the best. He, I mean, he was incredible. Uh, we, we did him over at Village. I remember meeting Ray Parker uh, uh, at the time, and uh, he was amazing. He would just walk around the studio singing with a, with a handheld microphone while we were all playing in the studio, you know. And uh, he's just a, an amazing interpreter, you know what I mean, uh, for, for, for as far as the singer goes. And he was a real character, too, you know. He used to all of a sudden, he just, if he forgot the lyrics, he'd just scream into the microphone, you know? So uh, we had a good time. It was very much fun. And uh, again, I, I really uh, look back uh, fondly on the Put Out the Light uh, uh, for the Joe Cocker record, you know? With Loggins and Messina, I've interviewed both those guys. And uh, what, what was it like uh, working with Jim Messina behind the controls? What was that like? Jim Messina is a great engineer. I mean, he engineered the uh, Buffalo Springfield records, the early one. And uh, uh, we went up to Jim, but Michael, speaking to Michael Lombardi, he recommended me for this job. So I thank him for that. And we went up to Jim Messina's Ojai Ranch and stayed for two weeks. And so everybody could live there and, and, and we could rehearse all day long and get into intricate arrangements and stuff like that. But you, they're so two very talented guys. Jim's a great guitarist, and Kenny is a great singer, you know? How could, you couldn't do any wrong with that band. You know, he comes up with, uh, uh, I've only talked to him once, it was a very long interview, and and uh, he was just sitting in his in his kitchen, and he comes up with these dates. On, yeah. And when I was doing Today in History on my sister channel, someone gave me hell for looking at my notes. I'm going, it's Today in History, man. You got to look yeah. at your notes. It's dates. Yeah. This guy... Yeah. Just like yeah. that. Scott Michael Cavagan said, did you ever regret turning down any sessions? Uh, did I re regret turning down any sessions? I didn't turn down that many sessions, but... Uh, did you always um, make it work? If they wanted you, you'd, you'd sort of try to make it work? I tried to make it work unless I was in over my head, you know, and uh, I'm trying to think, was there a, a session that I did? I'd have to think about that for a second. Because I don't think I turned down very many sessions, but uh, there might have been a few that uh, uh, I had to turn down. 
Anyway, I'll think about that. When an album on Wiki says all tracks are written by David Page, except where noted, I always pay attention to that. It, that, that, that the little balance thing. I, is it because it is because they were not, they didn't have the experience yet to do it? I mean, uh, and what's what album was this, do you think? Number one. Number one. Uh, yeah, everybody was new. This was all brand new to everybody doing, making records, you know, and, uh, I had made records and Jeff had made records, but Steve Bercaro hadn't and Luke hadn't and Bobby Kimball hadn't and me and Jeff and Hungate had done the Silk Degrees album. So uh, it was a new process and it was fun because I got everybody before everybody got the, all a lot of knowledge, you know what I mean? And uh, sometimes ignorance is bliss, you know, <laughs> uh, but uh it was so fun. I, I have a warm heart uh, spot in my heart for the first album because we got to take our time with it and do all old school. It was old school overdubbing and stuff, getting vocals in tune and uh, making sure all the details were right. You know, kind of like Steely Dan. And we learned that from playing with Seals and Crofts, the microscopic details and Steely Dan. Both were into very uh, particular about uh uh, takes and uh, tuning and the finer points of uh, producing. So uh, that was always a challenge. And we, it would set the bar at an early age uh, very high for us. To you, Michael Jackson was? Was. He was the greatest entertainer and talent uh, uh, at that time. And certainly one, one of the greatest of all time. You know what I mean? Michael, I can't say enough about... Uh, working with him, what a great person he was to work with and how much respect I have for him, his talent and uh, the best dancer in the world. And we're just a real sweet guy and everything. And, and, uh, but knew what he wanted. So it was, uh, uh, you know, when you put him and Quincy Jones together, you have someone who's the artist and you have someone who's, who's a, a, a master at producing an artist and letting the artist, uh, uh, reach his full potential there. So uh, it was always, uh, when Quincy was involved with something, it was always, it definitely were on board with that because uh, he's such a great producer, you know. I asked Bernie Ledden, uh, what would Hotel California have sounded like if uh, if you were in the band, if, if Joe hadn't come in? And he said, well, that's a cute question. But he said, and, he's, and he kind of said a few more things. What if, what would have happened to David Page if there was no Toto? Oh, geez. I would have probably tried to get a solo deal, you know, which I had been offered. I had been offered by Louis Shelton, the producer of uh, Seals and Crofts Records, uh, when I met him, because my dad was a musical director on the Glenn Campbell show, Glenn Campbell Good Time Hour. And Louis was uh, in, the ba in the orchestra that my dad picked. And so I met Louis and I would, I would play every Sunday down on the Glenn Campbell show. I would play a little Hammond organ or a little piano on some of the cuts and Louie and I started playing some songs on my, on the breaks and Louie offered me a, a solo album deal to, to, to produce me. And uh, my dad said, no, you're not ready. So he says, I'll let you know when you're ready. <laughs> so I turned that down and I waited till after Silk Degrees reached its peak. And then uh, uh, I made some demos, me and Jeff made some demos and uh Again, uh, if Toto hadn't happened, that would have probably been uh, pounding the floors, pounding the streets, uh, trying to sell songs, you know, and get them recorded or else do a solo record. I think you would have done pretty damn good. I, uh, just... I don't know, man. I I really uh, cherish the vehicle that I had and uh, the, the fact that and still have because Toto's still out there playing, performing, opening for Journey and doing really great in Europe and stuff. And I occasionally go out and play with them every once in a while. And uh, I'm the musical director for Toto, which means I get to re help rehearse the band and help uh, in the day-to-day -day, uh, uh, business administration that goes on. And uh, uh, again, Toto's been a full career, and it's, it's, it's just uh, been very fulfilling and satisfying. By the way, thanks for talking. I haven't talked to John Zaka since uh, he's talked to you and Luke, but... But it's great that you guys uh, took 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 part in that. Uh, yeah, yeah, we thought that, that uh, definitely. We always try and be inclusive of our band members and uh, and band members who are with us and who aren't with us. And uh, 
uh, we always uh, felt uh, have a warm spot in our uh, in our hearts for Bobby. You know, this is where I'm going to sound like I'm an idiot, but I forget the gentleman's name that was that replaced Joseph that came in after Joseph. What's your thoughts on, on that period? Uh, uh, Byron, Jean-Michel Byron, is that what his name? Yeah, that was one of them. We had Fergie Fredrickson. First no, I know that. Time. I'm going to Fergie in a second. Okay. Um, Jean-Michel uh, was a kind of an experiment. That's what the record company had found him and said, we think this would be a great lead singer for Toto. So we were like, we had heard a couple of things that he had done and said, yeah, that's, that's interesting for, to us, because Toto, you have to understand, Toto used to be a play behind so many different singers that we thought, oh, just give us another singer and we'll Totoize him. You know what I mean? Kind of uh, uh, make him, uh, uh, mold him into the, being the lead singer that we wanted. You know what I mean? And sometimes that worked and sometimes it didn't. You know, when I, uh, I told uh, Joe this, he laughed. I told Steve Pete this too. I said, when I got the greatest hits package, and I was all excited because I heard there was new songs on it. So I'm in Vancouver and I go down to the record store and, and I'm going, who is this guy? And then I heard, can right. you hear what I'm saying? I love, can you hear what I'm saying? I think that is just a- Yeah, I do too. It's one of my favorite. Yeah. Yeah, that was Mike Picaro. That was Mike Picaro a lot on that too, his bass playing. Yeah. And you see how, uh, what, an instru- what a great player he was, you know? Again, that's going back to having a band, having people that contribute a lot to your music, you know, and the arrangements were really part of the compositions themselves when it gets down to it, you know, the way Toto, the guys used to arrange their own parts and kind of produce themselves, you know, so it was, uh, we had a band full of arrangers and producers and writers, and that kind of helped in the process. I uh I I wrote a letter to the to the Toto fan club. Radio guys don't aren't supposed to do this because it's uncool, right? right. Yeah. Uh, but I wrote this long, angry letter, and I'm going. And my girlfriend at the time says, "What are you doing? You can't do that." And I'm going, <laughs> and I did anyway. I'm going. Where's Joseph? Oh, what the hell? Yeah. Joe said thanks. By the way, Rock Maker to me, that's one of those songs. I just that song has stayed with me for so uh, many years. If I'm in oh, a bad so mood, good. I put Rock Maker on it, and it makes me feel good. Yeah, oh, that's great to hear. I, I like that song a lot, and I think I thought at the time um, that was very indicative of me, my the way I played, the way I sang, and the way I wrote. Rock maker was typical of that. You know what I mean? So we used to play. Uh, you know, and we'd be on a someone else's recording session, and when they'd have a downtime or take a break, me and Jeff and Hungate. We, I, would, I would start playing these songs, rehearsing them, kind of, you know. So when we got into recording them, we kind of all knew knew how they went, you know, because we rehearsed them on other people's uh, record dates, you know, in, in, the, in our spare time. Is, is that just, like that. is that look sort of a, a just a, a picture of a, a rock guy? What's that? Does that song have a meaning behind it? Yeah, it's just about a guy who writes, who writes rock and roll songs, but has a, uh, tumultuous relationship you know uh, and uh uh is uh i kind of invented a romanticized the narrative there on it and uh you know it's kind of like you- rocket kind of like rocket man but it's rock maker yeah by the way is goodbye your your favorite elton uh what's your favorite album from elton i have to say madman across the water I have so many. I have so many albums that are that are my favorite. The first album is my favorite, and Madman. But Madman Across the Water has Levon on it, you know. And Levon's one of the greatest songs I've ever written and greatest records ever made to me. So, uh, you know, and I, I have a just. I'll, yeah, I can't say enough about Elton John. How what what a big influence he had on my life and. Uh, uh, the greatest story I love telling is when Rosanna uh, received record of the year, Elton was the first guy to stand up out of the audience and applaud and everything. And it doesn't get, it doesn't get any better than that. You know? Yeah. He, he, he likes Toto. Yeah, he does. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the, I'm, I'm on Thursday, Caleb Quay and I are, are doing a live feed. Uh, really? Yeah. Please, please tell Caleb I said hello. I will. Uh, he is such a cool guy. Like just yeah. a laid back. I hasn't talked to What a great guitar him. player. What a great guitar player. Yeah. Well, know? did you hear the story about the the new Britney thing with Tiny Dancer? No, I uh, didn't hear the story. Well, what happens is there was this hidden riff that Caleb did in that song that was kind of buried in the mix. Oh, so right. The new, okay. the new producer hears right. it 
when he strips everything away and he goes, what is this? Is this Jimi Hendrix? Because it was influenced by Jimi Hendrix. Caleb told me that. So I got a hold of him right away to get the background of it. And uh, I've got goosebumps actually talking about this right now because I love Madman so much. Yeah, right. Indian, Indian Sunset, all that stuff. Indian Sunset oh, yeah. made me cry. Oh, yeah, me too. Me too. So uh, all the nasties, by the way, just as an aside, all the nasties for a song about, about self-betrayal and betrayal in general, that song, the first four words of that song, I have... I have sung in my head. It tells a lot about my psyche, I guess, uh, in my head more than any other song. Because we all have these songs that we hum. That's and sometimes right. we're not conscious of it. Yeah. But anyway, Caleb said the producer uh, found it and made it the focal point of the new Elton Britney. That's that. great. I can't wait. I, I haven't heard that the Elton Britney thing yet, but I can't wait to hear it now. And knowing that little tidbit, thank you for that. You know? Do you have any favorite Canadian artists that uh, that you enjoy, love, know? Absolutely. Joni Mitchell. I'm a big Joni Mitchell fan. Huge Joni Mitchell fan. I'm, an, I'm, a, I'm a diehard Oscar Peterson fan. The great jazz of course. pianist. Of course. You know? Did you and, have his uh, records when you were younger? Did you, did yes. You ever... Yes, I used to try and slow them down, but they would be in different keys. You can slow records down now and they stay in the same key. But back then you had to learn it in a different key because I, he was played so fast that we had to slow everything, try to slow the record player down, you know? And uh, uh, again, I know Brian, I work with Brian Adams up in Vancouver and he's one of my all time favorites. Brian is. And uh, was that so a Jim Balance's was... studio? It must've been a Jim Balance's studio or. Yeah, it was his, his house, Brian's house. Oh, wow. He had a recording studio there. So I know Joe Brian has a studio, but we were at his house recording, you know. What and, was that uh, like? That was fun. That was a lot of load of fun. And uh, Brian got to, was producing me, and I kind of uh, gave him a little taste of uh, how I work, you know, which is a potpourri of uh, my first pass. I used to give you a little bit of everything and then let you choose from the menu what direction do you kind of like it going here, you know? You know. That's what you do? Yeah. yeah. Sometimes, sometimes, well, if, I, if, I, if I feel comfortable enough. David Foster. Uh, brilliant. Can't say enough about him. He's a great guy. Very big heart. Uh, very generous. Does a lot of charities and uh, uh, has given of, of his own time. And I can't say how much talent he has. I mean, look at After the Love is Gone uh, with Earth, Wind and Fire and Jim and Jay Graydon. And... Uh, what a talent! What a super! What a what an icon! What an iconic talent! You know what I mean? Where did you come up with the like? Hold the line that intro. How old was that by the time you that's we we heard that song? Was it old? Did you always tinker with that? How go far back does it go? I had that in uh, when I was around twenty or twenty one. I just moved out of my parents' house and because uh, I was going to school. See, so I got my first apartment and my first little upright piano in my apartment, and that's the riff I started playing. So this is a, this is around we're talking about 73, 74. I may have had that riff, you know, and uh, I started playing it, playing it, and then started writing a little song about it. And uh, it turned up uh, at a total uh, when we first brought Bobby Kimball in, we we were trying to get, figure out how to who's going to be singing a song like that, you know, and he sang the shit out of it, you know what I mean? So uh, it was really great uh, 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 marriage and chemistry on that song to have our band playing because they, they play, play so good on it, you know? Yeah. That, uh, I, I love the story with Glenn Fry talks about uh, uh, Jackson Brown with Dr. My Eyes. He kept, oh, yeah. he, he was working on that and the, the Eagle special, he was just keep working, kept working on that. And he says, were you, were you ever in that situation where your neighbors would go, that guy, I've heard that riff. So, cause you got to work on stuff sometimes, you know, you go, it's not quite right. And Oh, definitely. I know I played the, I played the hold the line riff so long that people were pounding on my doors, like to stop playing and stuff like that. I almost got evicted from my apartment for, because of, of playing that riff, I think for three days before I showed it to the band, you know. Valdi, 1975, uh, Canadian. Valdi. Uh, very granola. Uh, uh, um, I'm trying to get him right now. I, 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 Paul Rothschild. Is that his name? That, I think so. He produced The Doors. Paul Rothschild 
was the producer of the Valdi record, I believe. Anyway, Jim Horn was on that. And I remember Klaus, that's where I met Klaus Vorman, the bass player. And uh, Jim Keltner was on it, Jim Horn, and and again, Klaus Vorman. So that was a, a very interesting project. You were. I forgot, uh, I forgot he was Canadian. Yeah, yeah. He. Uh, I think he lives in Salt Spring Island. He's a very granola guy. He's like the Bill Henderson of Chilliwack. They all live on the, one of the islands. I don't know how they can afford it, but they can. Because right. I can't even afford to go back to Vancouver now. It's impossible. California is like that, isn't it? Really expensive. Yes, it is. Yeah. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Um, Melanie, Photograph. That's an album I bought because of the cover. I knew who Melanie was. I knew she was at uh, Woodstock. I looked at that cover and I remember going, I want to buy this uh, uh, album. Cyclone is one of my favorite songs from that era. What was it like working with her? She's a great, very great talent. I love folk artists. You know what I mean? I love folk rock and stuff. And uh, she was this shy little girl that had, uh, you know, these songs and everything. And it was fun just to try and... uh, uh, interpret her songs the way she wanted them you know and i haven't listened to that so- album in a long time i need to pull that out again and give it a listen because i haven't heard it in years but it's i got a great. chance to use jim jim gordon of course on drums and dean parks on guitar and uh i think david hungate may have played bass for me on that but that's when i started producing records with my dad and uh that was a fun experience uh, again everything was uh uh, a, a lot of fun and a lot of inventive, creative stoles uh, participating in a lot of those that music. You know, yeah, she's a real very iconic uh, girl that was uh, really uh, had her own sound. You know what I mean? Her own sound and uh, uh, brought the Edwin Hawkins singers in on that one big song. She had the gospel choir on. You know, um, but uh, she was great. There's a timber in a voice. Yeah, yeah, uh-huh. that's uh, right. Speaking of re- of working with your dad, Cheryl Lynn, I didn't ask you last time about that. Uh, that that wasn't see, I wasn't into R and B music at all or dance music at all at the time. And I heard that song to be real, and I rushed out and I went out and bought that album like right away. Oh, that's tell me, fantastic! Tell that's me about that experience. Year. That was great. That was um, uh, my dad had heard her on the Gong Show. And he called someone at C- uh, CBS, Sony, you know, it was Columbia Records at the time, called, uh, he knew Bruce Lundvall and the president. And uh, my dad said, I'd really like to work with her. So she had just started a, a solo album, but it wasn't going in the right direction, apparently. And so they turned it over to me and my dad. And that was the first thing. I had this riff that I would play for, you know, hours and hours and hours, which was the opening riff uh, to the song there after the intro is actually. And uh, that was a real easy record to make. Uh, we had Ray Parker, myself, James Gadson, and David Shields on bass. That was a couple of songs. And then we brought Bernard Purdy and Chuck Rainey in and David T. Walker in for a few songs. And uh, what a life-changing experience it was. You know, we get to play with all those guys and it was a fun album. That's, that album still sounds great. Fantastic. Yeah, thank you. All us boys, you know what I got? I think I told you last time. So when I was doing the Toto 14 review, it took me two months to do it because I hadn't done video before. So I did the Toto review and I went and I did the history of Toto reach going up to uh, going up to 14, uh, which blew my mind, by the way. Just that album was the most pleasant surprise of music. I, I don't I, I'm, I swear to God, I, I love that album so much. I played it to death, but I didn't know how to present myself on camera yet. So it took me two months to do the video. Like every day I'm working on it, trying to. Right. Do it. So but I say in in the history that I said, I loved all us boys. And I mentioned this to you last time. Uh, but uh, to me, that sounds like a great show tune. And yeah, I don't mean is. that in disrespect. Yeah, it is. Well, we used to play it a couple of times uh, in the early days there, but I was now, again, that was my showing my Elton John roots there, you know, after Saturday Night's All Right, you know, the way Elton would do that song and everything and kind of influenced me to do All Us Boys. And uh, that was one of the songs that Steve Lukather auditioned for. Uh, he pl- came in and that uh, was the audition. Was, okay, you're playing guitar on All Us Boys. And he went out in the hallway of Davlin Studios and learned it real quick and came back in and uh, played this that one that was the first solo we ever played on it and it was amazing the whole end of all us boys you know and uh 
Jimmy Webb. I love Jimmy Webb, a huge influence on my life. I met Jimmy when uh, Jimmy was when I was 10 years old and Jimmy was 17. And my dad did the uh, um, Fifth Dimension album with Up, Up and Away on it, which my dad got a Grammy uh, nomination for. It. And uh, he was before Elton John, he was my biggest influence uh, at the time with all of his uh, incredible writing. I mean, MacArthur Park, what a what an iconic uh, uh, song that was, you know, so to, to, for them to play a five minute song on the radio was absolutely wonderful, you know. And uh, he influenced me uh, with uh, uh, his uh, literature and reading, he told me to read E.E. E. Cummings for uh, uh, poetry, for uh, uh, lyrical ideas. And uh, he was he's such a talented guy. I worked on his album uh, produced by George Martin uh, that Jimmy Webb did. And uh, that was really fun. And uh, uh, just uh, Jimmy's a, such a, a group, gifted t- songwriter that I I long to be uh, his, his boot shiner. You know what I mean? I remember telling Luke once, I says, where do you freaking come up with these grooves and these guitar parts? I mean, the, one doesn't sound like, I mean, I don't know where you come up with it, but Jimmy Webb as a songwriter is one of those guys. When I yeah. heard Wichita Lineman, I mean, that's one of those oh, songs yeah. that makes you stop in your tracks. I know. Yeah. Yeah. It's such an incredible song. And he was on a roll with Glenn. His his songs with Glenn Campbell's voice, that was a marriage. That was like Burt Bacharach with Dion Warwick. You know what I mean? Yeah, and Bernie. The, 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 the material was made for that singer, you know, and it was uh, it, it was a good fit. Doobie Brothers, yeah. Living on the Fault Line. I just talked to Jeff Skunk Baxter a couple of times, and uh, he, he said, you know what? I can understand now, looking back, why maybe at that time that album didn't hit like it was supposed to. Yeah. Uh, but Jeff just, he says, I love that album. You were on that album. Yeah, yeah. I got to do horns and strings on that record. And uh, I learned from uh, I learned a lot about doing vocals from uh, Ted Templeman. That was uh, had this Mike McDonald had just joined the Doobie Brothers, and uh, I heard how he was layering those vocals with Mike McDonald and the band. So he taught me a few things there, and uh, uh, it was great. Of course, Mike McDonald's a joy to work with, and Ted Templeman was mainly the guy who I would work with uh, uh, on that album. And my father helped out with some of the arrangements. He was always uh, uh, my wingman, or I was his wingman, one or the other, you know, on these arrangements. So uh, uh, fun memories. You know, when I talk to people, a lot of times they'll say things like, well, my father didn't get it. My uh, uh, my father was like John Helliwell of Super Tramp the other day. He says, oh, my God, uh, they went to see uh, John Helliwell's parents went to see him in concert. And he came up to the sound guy or the producer or whoever it was and said, I shall never do that again. That like to, I'm going, oh my God. But it, <laughs> yeah. he was just wired differently. And to him, it was all yeah. uh, classical music. Oh, you, sure. you were with a guy who could touch a whole bunch of different things, but you spent like, that's like the most, it's, it's not only quality time with your dad, but it's also quality time in the music industry history. That's right. Like, that's oh my right. God. So- and it's so because all the my dad was so respected that he knew everybody uh, from a musician standpoint, and uh, so I got to watch like the mamas and the papas make records with Hal Bl- Hal Blaine and Joe Osborne and Larry Nectel, the, the the best rhythm section I ever heard at that time. You know that was my my favorite wrecking crew guys uh, were those three guys doing the Johnny Rivers records, the mamas and the papas records uh fifth dimension records you know all those kind of things and uh uh just can't say enough you know dusty springfield when i talked to jeff he had said i think it might have been around the same era he said dusty wasn't doing really well at the time he says she wasn't on top for a game yeah it, yeah but she was she was still great to work with that whiskey voice i remember i was still playing piano i remember it was kenden records kenden uh recording studio in Burbank. And I remember I was playing through the song and she sat down next to, next to me on the piano bench and started singing it. And it was just that that real gruff, dusty Springfield voice. And it was just magical. I mean, I, I got chills. A lot of people in North America, it's kind of, it's not quite a Cliff Richard thing where Cliff was the Elvis of, of the UK, 
But right. a lot of people in North America sometimes don't know who who really she was and what she had accomplished. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. She was very under undervalued. Sergeant Pepper's uh, a soundtrack. Uh, how did that happen? What did you do? That that the infamous movie. Yeah, right. Um, the, again, that was the period where we were working with George Martin and I think Jimmy Webb because uh, we were at Cherokee. And uh, George, uh, Sergeant Pepper, that I heard everybody was talking about the Sergeant Pepper, the movie, the movie, the movie. And George got involved. And we were like, George, what's up with the movie? You know, he wanted us to come in and play on the very last track. I think the Bee Gees sing on it. I can't really remember it. I remember recording it with George Martin and Jeffrey Emmerich. And it was the very last track. And uh, uh, I said, George, why did you do this? He says, well, I... I, I didn't really want to do the movie, but I felt a, a responsibility to not turn it over to somebody else to get, to, I, I thought it's really not going to be done nearly right uh, if I'm not involved. So he kind of got, got, kind of got involved to uh, make sure that uh, he took care of his, uh, his boys, you know what I mean? The Beatles and uh, kind of brought to it uh, uh, the continuity of, from him, you know? Did the Beatles affect you the way that uh, affected everybody else in 64? Absolutely. To this day, I, I have my radio on the serious Beatle channel right here. All Every day I listen to nothing but the Beatles all day long, really. They affected me so much. Did you meet, work with them? Um, I worked with McCartney on the Thriller album uh, right. with Michael Jackson on The Girl Is Mine. And that was a magical experience. And... Uh, I played one time. I played one time with Ringo on a demo. Uh, Jim Keltner had called me, and there was a guy named uh, I think his name was Guthrie Thomas, and it was a guy who, who was just a folk singer and doing a demo of Capitol Records. And I showed up there for play piano, and I saw Ringo Starr on the, on the drum kits, you know, next to Keltner, and I was just am amazing again uh, uh, to be in a room and share share uh headphones with a with a beetle you know those are all those are still big stars to me the beatles the stones and elton are the biggest out there you know to me it will always be the biggest yeah El elton is one of those stars that i i, I find it, it two three days don't go by without me listening to yeah and you know i'm discovering some of the 80s stuff and i know by the way why is it speaking of that why is it is it Elton's stuff would be, the phrasing would be more complicated in the 70s. Like, you know, you could see you, you, he would, uh, um, but by the time he got to, the, is that a normal part of aging? Because it's so, like Little Genie is a dumbed down version of what I'm trying to say of, of the fact that the songs, you know what I mean? Artists do this sometimes. They'll, they'll have, when they're young, they'll have these complicated phrasings of how they. Right. Yeah. I think that, uh, I don't know, maybe as a writer gets older, he tries to just simplify and write simpler, always writing simpler. You know, uh, when you've written as much as Elton's has, there's really no rules or boundaries, you know, for what you're doing. And uh, Elton has an amazing talent for, ch for being able to sing a, a lot of words in a song, like Bernie's. Bernie's writing poetry. And Elton gets all those words in. He's the only guy who can get those words in. That's reminding me of Africa. I was I was vote nominated to sing Africa because I was the only guy that could sing all the words and get get up that many words in. You know what I mean? So uh, I I I I feel uh, um, uh, linked to Elton through so through songs. Because I can, I learned from singing Elton John songs all the time in my room uh, how to phrase uh, lots of words. You know what I mean? So uh, you're good at that, yeah. And I love the, yeah. I like I, the quality of your voice that I love is is there's a there's a, I don't know, it's not a softness. There's a there's just a feel to, to the to the way you sing to me when that I really paid attention to with the first album. I remember going, oh my god, they have all these singers. But really, at that point, it was you and Bobby that I paid attention. Yeah. yeah. I've just got a few questions from fans. Is that okay? Yeah, absolutely. This is Sunday 187 on YouTube. Would love to hear his thoughts on working with John Anderson. Um, John Anderson was, uh, I, again, uh, I, the iconic band, yes. 
was a very major influence on Toto. We were always using them as our kind of a standard. And I got to work on his solo record and uh, in between takes, I would just start playing stuff that I got into John Anderson mode here, uh, you know, try to, to uh, uh, start writing things. And he picked up on it and asked me to come over to my house and see if we could write some more. So we did uh, uh, write some more and uh, he just picked up the mic and started singing the words uh, as we as we speak, you know what I mean. As we were playing, and he and it was amazing. It was just like he'd uh, already rewritten written the song before he even heard it, you know. And he's so fast and uh, has such an iconic voice. And uh, so uh, I really enjoyed those sessions with him. You know, uh, John is one of those guys. I always say the same thing about John Anderson. He was a great interview, uh, very joyous. You know, for just, just yes. You know, he's just fun to be around, but he's, I said, I even told him, I said, you know what? And it was, it was one of the brave, I, said, I would have never picked you for yes, but I would have been so incredibly wrong because everyone had an image of a type of, like Brad Gelp or something. And I love that. That's right. But, right. but, but I, I would have been so wrong not to pick him because he ended up being so perfect for that band. Yeah, it was. He absolutely was, you know, and, uh, uh, he, we had him sing on Can't Stop Loving You on the, uh, um uh, the seventh one album and uh again he put in his inimitable uh uh phrasing and stuff like that too we only he only had lived in a couple spots but it was uh we we had, we got a big kick out of it jay hendrix i wonder who his favorite artist is any chance you guys play any deep cuts on oh well you're not going to be on the journey total tour right you might make an appearance but you i might make an appearance but i won't be on that tour no okay um Oh, this is nice. He says, please tell him thanks for all the delicious piano playing, especially Flower from the Rain, Miss Sun, get, uh, Got to Be Real, Georgie Porgy, uh, <laughs> just a thank you thing. And who's this from? This is from Drum Toy 2002. Oh, great. God bless him. Oh, you know the seventh one to me? Uh, this guy yeah. is asking Fender Stratocaster 8479. Uh, for me, these change is the best Toto track ever. Um, you know, the, the seventh one to me helped me when I was going through one of the worst periods of my life. And and uh -huh. I'd heard Joe on the, the previous album. But for for me, personally, everything that was, was on Fahrenheit just completely gelled together on the seventh. I'm going like, yeah. that's like a perfect record to me. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, we tried to uh, go back to the to the kind of the methodology that we did on the first record, you know, which was make, making a full production of it. And we we were able to get uh, G George Massenberg and Billy Payne to yeah. our shoulders. And it was really, uh, uh, again, a magical experience. And uh, we got Pamela out of that, which was a very big record. I heard it even was selling, they were playing it up in uh, Canada. They were. Uh, Pamela was, you know, and... Uh, uh of unfortunately the record company closed its doors to uh right when we were getting uh, near the top 10 uh with our record uh they closed the doors so the record fell off the charts but uh that would have been a big record pamela and uh again these chains was uh, that's iconic lucather that's him singing and playing and uh his, the piano part is him when he he writes a lot on piano and i i write a lot for guitar it's funny because a lot of the guitar things are come out of my head, but when you hear great piano parts like that on uh, uh, these chains, uh, uh, that's Luke, you know, full on uh, pure unadulterated Luke. He's my and, favorite guitarist of all time. Yeah, Arnold. absolutely. I can, I can, I can vouch for that. I can validate that. Unequivocal will be, you know. Jeff Skunk Baxter told me, he says, uh, I said, what, how did, Pat Simmons, who was the glue when they were changing singers, right. and and Tom, uh, I said, how can these guys, after all these years, still be side by side? No, we don't hear. If there's drama, I'm not hearing it. Right. And uh, he said, because they're still friends. What's the glue between you and Luke? You guys go so far back, and you're there. You are. Yeah, I think because we, I knew, I met Luke in high school, and I used to go to these high school gigs and see them play. You know, when we were, we were, I had already been doing records, me and Jeff, but we'd show up at like it's Luke and Luke and Steve Picaro had a band. It was a continuation of our high school band when we left to go and join Sonny and Cher 
me and Jeff, uh, Luke and Steve Percaro picked up on our band and kind of continued the, uh, the legacy um, of, uh, it was called Still Life. And uh, uh, me and Luke, we just have had, uh, uh, he's uh, just been a, an, an amazing guitarist and such a friend for years, you know, and uh, he's, his sense of humor is, he's got a ridiculous sense of humor, the very broad, very liberal, broad stance on that one there. I don't <laughs> think anybody's, uh, uh, there's no, nobody like him. He broke the mold. Okay. You know, if you were retired and you were just watching, hanging out, doing your thing, whatever you do, yeah. who would be the artist that would get you out of retirement? Who would be the artist to get me out of retirement, huh? Uh, if I was asked to play with him, like that kind of thing? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, of course, uh, Elton John, you know what I mean? You know, which I got to play on, on one record for him. And, uh, uh, oh, there's so many out there, you know. I would love to uh, work with Bruno Mars. I think he's a fabulous talent. You know, I think Adele's a fabulous talent, you know. I like singers, my dad always worked with great singers. David Foster always works with great singers. And uh, I love great singers myself. So it would be something like that, you know. I talked to a lot of people who worked with David in the early years. And and all of them say the same thing, which is great. They said, we knew without a shadow of a doubt that guy no. would land on his feet. There's no way he couldn't. Yeah, yeah. He was, he was definitely... Uh, every bit, every bit of talent, you know what I mean? And uh, I can't say enough good things about him. The fact that the seventh one has come full circle, though, the fact that in yeah. the end, the fans have also picked that as well as all the, you know, where they cherry pick and all fans do, but that, that rises just like, you know, the, your, your yeah, best really. records. Oh, that's great. I'm going to have to rediscover that and listen to it again, you know? Yeah. Uh, I like, I'll tell you the, my favorite track on that though is uh, stay away the one where we share with Linda Ronstadt. And, you said it uh, should have been a single, right? You said that. It should have been a single, yeah. Yeah, I think he's got, there's two DJs that called me from, that was up in, in the northern area, I couldn't even be in Canada. The, they called me and they said that this was Bon Jovi's Living on a Prayer, that Stay Away was blowing that off their record, uh, off their radio station. And they couldn't get enough of it, you know. And uh, But the part of the... Uh, I think the negotiation to have Linda play on her record was that we couldn't release it as a single, you know, the at least the first single there uh, and uh, for the record, you know, and uh, 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 I, I, I regret not releasing, just ignoring everybody and releasing that as a hit single. Cause I think Ronstadt uh, total with Linda Ronstadt was a great marriage. And I think that's a, a great record. David yeah. Lindley's on guitar too, you know. Oh my God! On, on slide guitar with Lukather, and they did that live. They both played live in the studio, uh, overdubbing together at the same time. You know, after I talked to John Hellowell of Supertramp, uh, I went into uh, Bob Siebenberg, their drummer. I went into their. Uh, I also want to share this with. I went into the, his website, and he has the Roger Hodgson era of the where he so shows where he played. Rod, he says Supertramp one. And, and then after Roger left, he puts it as Super Tramp 2. And it's like a, a Deep Purple. You know how you know how they do it? They mark one, a, a Deep Purple, mark two for different. Because bands are going to change members because yeah. shit happens in life, right? They do. They do. Is there, a, is there an era or a, a version of Toto that you like more than the other that stands out? Uh, I like when we did uh, Kingdom of Desire. I liked it when it was a core, like a quartet. It was me, I think, uh, Jeff and Mike and Luke, you know, and Steve Picaro, of course, was doing overdubs for us. But we had a quartet that we wrote an album for, you know, and I think that's the one Bob Clearmountain mixed and Greg Madani uh, recorded. But uh, uh, I'll always have a place in my heart for the first uh, Toto uh, albums, you know, that we did up and through Total Four, you know, which was uh, myself, uh, David Hungate, Jeff Percaro, Steve Lukather, Bobby Kimball, and Steve Percaro. I think that was a great uh, combination of players. And uh, every um, 
other band uh, that's been since then has been, it's, uh, uh, I've loved it in, there in different ways, you know what I mean? Different configurations for the band. And so, uh, but I think that first one was uh, is one of my favorites. Was there pressure on you? Well, that first one though, because of the fact that you're the, you had a lot, I mean, they all had history and in order to get in that room, man, yeah. you know, yeah. you, you have to have your stuff, but did you feel pressure or were you young enough and or naive or just you had chutzpah? Like, what was it? Yes. All of those things, <laughs> all of those things, you know, we felt we were very confident in, in what we could do, especially after we had the first album and it went double platinum. Then we knew that we could just about do anything. We thought we could just about do anything, which is why we did Hydra, you know, and just kind of said, well, if you like that, you're really going to like this stuff right here because it's more, it was more progressive. And we were trying to grow as a band too, uh, musically and show that we were, weren't just uh, pumping out. Uh, uh, here's uh, the first album, part two, you know what I mean? And, uh, uh, it, again, um, it was a very transformative time for us, you know. And but we uh, w again, we were very confident, and we thought we we thought we could do no wrong, you know. I remember when Tambu came out. I was, you know, we in radio stations we'll have one copy of Billboard, yeah, one, right. and you you have a little list of who can see it. And once you you tap your name, I've read it, I've read it. And I remember I was the last guy to get that copy, and they, they Billboard had mentioned had done a mention or something of Tambu. Yeah. And wh uh, why was it decided about the, the 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 Luke lead singer thing? How how did that come about? Well, I think Toto got frustrated uh, with trying to have uh, find the lead singers for our band, you know. And he was we hired we got Luke there because he also we we knew that he sang very well, you know. And Luke's a great singer, and uh, so we always had that to fall back on. You know what I mean? Our, see, that was our secret weapon, is Lugather singing, you know, which he sung, he sings ballads. He writes ballads and sings them and and just kills it, you know. And so, uh, uh, again, the Tambu era, I was going through a down period because my father had just passed. So I wasn't, I didn't participate a whole lot in that record, but I did play on all the tracks and stuff like that. But as far as the production goes and stuff, that was done a lot, uh, with the band, and I think uh, Elliot Shiner helped with with that album. When I heard Fergie, I remember going, "He's a." Sh it's almost like I found his voice very sharp, but I yeah. I, I thought he was a great yeah. singer. Yeah, but, right. And Stranger in Town was a great video. I mean, that yeah, was thanks. just that was such a great idea. I couldn't believe, and I went, "Oh my, they're doing the Jesus thing." I'm not religious at all, but I'm going. That is so cool. Um, yeah. yeah. And that was, you know, got a lot of airplay in in Canada. Uh, how did that happen with Fergie? I know what happened to Bobby. Bobby actually had told me about four years ago, and Luke talked about it. Yeah. But um, how did you how did you find him? Uh, there was a band, and I forget the name of the band, but Jeff Percaro knew of a, of a band, uh, a guy singing in a band. It was Fergie down in New Orleans. Uh, and I can't remember the name of the band, but I'll, I'll put it up. Of, I'll put it up right there at when, when don't worry. I'll, I'll yeah, I'm sure you'll that. find it. You know, anyway, we heard the singer and what we're looking for is someone who, who looked good and could sing and could sing up in that higher area, you know, and we felt that we could mold him to be fit, to be a Toto singer. You know what I mean? Cause again, because Toto had worked with so many singers, we knew how to conform and uh chameleonize ourselves into playing different ways you know and uh so uh uh i know bobby had done three or four of the cuts on the isolation album he had sang them sung them and i and, and and they were good but we were struggling with him at the time and uh there were we we're going there were issues which i won't go into but uh, that uh uh we just felt we had to make a change the Dune soundtrack. Well, tell me about the making of that because all of us, I was, and in no disrespect, but I didn't put you guys in that. When I heard, I remember it might have been Entertainment Tonight or something with Mary yeah. Hart's. They had mentioned that, that that you guys were doing the soundtrack. And I remember I was pleasantly surprised, but I was so surprised that you were doing it in the first place. I tell mean, me about that experience and how you got that gig. And We got that gig. We First of all, we heard Ridley Scott was directing it originally. 
And uh, we were very excited about that, you know, and someone said, well, you're up for, you know, there's you, your name has been tossed on, on, in the hat. You're on the radar, on their radar. And we're like, really? And that would be very cool. And we had just done total four and wanted to take some time off and, uh, and uh, do different things. And so it was perfect because I'd always wanted to do a movie. And uh, I know Queen had done uh, uh, that movie that they had done the music for. I forget which oh, one. Oh, Flash Gordon. Yeah, Flash Gordon. And uh, uh, I got a call that they were meeting. They were down filming down in Mexico. And they wanted to fly me down there and bring something with me, bring me some music. That could uh, that I could play them, you know. So the first uh, uh, I wrote uh, in my head, I I wrote the the main theme to Dune before I got down there, thinking, you know, I want to see a big like Lawrence of Arabia with the desert blowing. Dino De Laurentiis presents, you know. And so I got down there, and David Lynch came up to me, and he had a Walkman on, and he put the Walkman on my head and he said can you do this kind of music and it was Shostakovich music it was symphonic but very slow very dark and very low and said can you do this and I said I'm your guy you know yes yes I can ride that horse I can do anything you know at the time I got to Max meet Max von Sydow down there which was a real honor and uh I just he goes fine he goes you got the gig you have it you know and uh so Toto started working on it. We hadn't done a movie together, but we'd uh, 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 we decided that I was going to go off to Vienna and record the orchestral music, while Toto was going to be be doing uh, kind of sound design stuff and all the percussion, all the percussion stuff with Hypercarl was playing on snare drums and stuff too. With the with leading percussionists, we got to uh, uh, do the uh, percussion on the Dune record. And uh, and Luke, of course, did some brilliant guitar sounds, and uh, so it was a, it was an experimental again a transformative time for us and very experimental, but uh, uh, it was a it was a challenge, you know. I find uh, in my aut- Luke and I had talked about you know having autistic kids, but I found through my autistic daughter I, I, I realized something about myself, and then everyone says, "Well, I'm like that too." Where that if I'm concentrating, like today after this interview, I'm going to start chopping this up, but I'm not going to do anything else but chop it up. And if I do anything else, I start losing my focus. And uh, but I, that's how I'm, I I work. Are you? What are you like when you were doing a, a project like that? That's a completely different animal. You can just do yeah. that. Yeah. No. That that was a, again a challenge for the time. I mean, you had a thing called a key lock that had to sync the machines up. We were on, uh, you know, uh, the sync multi-track machines up, and it was hard. It was, it was a learning process for all of us. We were going through because we were trying to uh, stay on the edge, uh, on the cutting edge there. And uh, uh, again, it's it 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 was we were so used to, p- to putting on these thinking caps, but when we when we uh, uh, decided to do Dune, uh, it kind of really pushed our pushed our limits as to what we've been able to do, you know, but again, we thought we were, uh, uh, you know, we could do anything at the time. We had a lot of confidence. And so, and we were, we we wanted to challenge ourselves, get out of our comfort zone there, you know. When, when uh, the band goes out again, uh, being the musical director, is there a possibility, and many have asked this, that uh, uh, there will be some deep cuts perhaps, or uh, shifting around? I mean, they're always asking Elton that. Um, I know. I know. I'm sure there will be some deep cuts. Uh, I'm sure the show will get changed around a little bit from last time, but uh, it should be fairly close to the last Journey show, I believe. You know what I mean? Oh, uh, a few people have said they really, they really, really miss you, but they just want you to be happy, which is so nice. Oh, that's great. That's so good. You know, it's nice when people. Uh, there's again, it's this, it's this, 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 these total fans, like it's. I've never seen the fact that they care about the person, not just yeah. because he does the music. Yeah. 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 Well, we've always, we've always done these uh, uh, meet and greets after the rich shows and a lot of the fans, we spend time with them, you know, and uh, take time to, to, to talk and sign autographs and, and do stuff with the band for the band. And uh, 
uh, I think that's left an, an, uh, uh, an imprint on our fans, you know, an impression on our fans and uh, uh, that, that makes them, uh, uh, makes everything cohesive together, you know, with the, uh, with the fans and us. And uh, we're, we, again, we're very grateful to have our fans, but with, though they're so loyal and so, t- and uh, personable uh, uh, when it comes to uh, con- 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 complimenting us on our music. Yeah. And uh, I think they enjoy our music, not only with Toto, but with all the people we've worked with. I think our, by, by being uh, uh, listeners, I think they feel that they know us better intimately because of the music that we've made. You know, I think that's a, a very communicative uh, uh, medium, you know. Brian Pastoria uh, says, did Michael Jackson ever sing the parts he wanted uh, you to play? Uh, let me think about that for a second. No, but he would point, if he wanted you to play something, he would play the record play his thriller record and say, I want you to do something that works with this, but he wouldn't actually sing the song, sing what you, what he wants us to play. And he said, do whatever you want to do. Just think of Michelangelo painting the Sistine Chapel and, and the sky's the limit. You have total freedom here. That's the way Michael Jackson started out is, is always his production talk. That's amazing. It is. That's the greatest thing an artist could ever say. You know what I mean? Mark Perella says, what special song from Toto or anything else connects you emotionally with Mike or Jeff? With Mike and Jeff? Um, geez, I'd have to say probably, can, can you hear what I'm saying? Maybe one of them, you know what I mean? That's one of them. There's so many though, because we played live, you know, we played live together. And Mike was so great live. And I just saw a, um, uh, a performance of ours at Montreux Jazz Festival. And I was watching with Shania Twain and Nathan East. And everybody was just getting a big kick out of the band performing at uh, Montreux Jazz Festival. And Mike Ricaro, what up? Wait, 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 wait a minute. So you're watching Toto with Shania Twain and Nathan East? I know Nathan yeah, was and, and, and at the We're at the Montreux Jazz Festival up in a suite with big t- TV screens. And what they do is they put on these these old performances of different artists that have played there. And uh, so I had been asked to just uh, uh, fly over and attend the Montreux Jazz Festival just as friends. And uh, so uh, everybody was watching this in the room and uh, getting a big kick out of uh, uh, the Toto show, the rock show. And uh, it was fun watching Luke and Mike uh, in our in our younger years, the way everybody was so good good at performing and playing the stuff, you know. So, but I used to play with Mike in the high school. I have to say, my favorite days were with our high school band, and Mike Ricaro was the bass player, and we had two drummers, Jeff Ricaro and a guy named Kelly Shanahan. So it was like Buddy Miles Express. It was like a Mad Dogs and Englishmen kind of band, and Mike was the groundkeeper. He would hold hold the uh, hold the band together. You know, him and Jeff were like a, 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 a fortress, you know, a force of nature. Jenny King, Jenny from Chicago, good Chicago nurse. Uh, she says, what was the first song you ever wrote? And what inspired it? The first song I ever wrote. Uh, I think there was a song called Face Beneath the Crown was a song I wrote back in high school. And it was like me doing my impression of Elton John, uh, The King Must Die, you know what I mean? On the first record. on the, the It's actually Elton's second record, the Elton John record, because Empty Sky, I think, was his first record. Yeah. But this was the- But it wasn't the, released in North America until the mid yeah. 70s. Yeah, the King, the, King, the King Must Die. That was the title, right? On the first album. And yeah. so I was, I was trying to imitate those kind of songs. Will you ever work with uh, Steve P, Steve P? Sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Steve and I stay in touch. And uh, I just did an organ solo for Steve P uh, on one of his, he's working on another solo record. And I just did an organ solo for him. He sent me a file and I played it. And, and so uh, we, we stay in contact. Jim Gordon, memories of him. 
Jim was a, just always had a smile on his face and was a great drummer, you know. That's the Jim Gordon I knew, you know. And uh, uh, again, he was the kind of the guy that followed Hal Blaine around in town and uh, started doing a lot of what Hal, uh, Hal Blaine would throw him record dates. So he ended up playing on uh, another favorite Canadian artist of mine, Gordon Lightfoot. And uh, Jim played on that stuff. And uh, of course, he played on classical classical gas, which was a great record. And uh, of course, Mason Williams, yeah, yeah. Of course, the Derek and the Domino stuff is infamous. And uh, he wrote Layla with Clapton, you know. And uh, so uh, he was a great musician and graduated from the same high school that we used to play all of our gigs at, which is Grant High School, which is where Steve, Jeff, and Luke. Uh, Steve Picaro, Mike, Jeff, and Luke all went to school there. Uh, last question. Do you, uh, any regrets at all? Uh, any regrets? No, I don't believe in regrets, you know? Yeah, because yeah, you know what? Any 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 change, because, you know, the cliche question is, oh, if you yeah. could whisper, and I've asked that question, yeah. but everyone said, a lot of people say, well, I wouldn't be talking to you right now, perhaps, or I wouldn't have yeah. met my wife, or yeah. I wouldn't have yeah. my son, or... Yeah, yeah. Uh, I wish we. I wish we had picked a better name. That's one of my regrets. I love we were, that name. I we love were that searching. Name. We were searching for a name like Toto, and it just ended up on our demo boxes. So it ended up in our contracts, you know. And uh, we were looking for something simple like the Who, Yes, the Beatles, the Eagles, you know, something like that. So were there any other uh, alternatives? Did you do you remember any alternatives that you had? No, I remember where there was a. Somebody always threw was throwing names at us and stuff, but uh, uh, no, we just settled on Toto. You know, what's the part of your your recording your history that that maybe people forgot about, or you'd want that you're proud of, or that maybe people don't know about? Is there something that we haven't talked about, for instance? Uh, not really. There was just so many records that we played on that weren't released, you know, and sometimes. Uh, uh, uh working on the with artists unknown artists is fun some of the times because there's no pressure you know and uh uh i think that uh a lot of records didn't get released a lot of some of our best performances may or beaten may or may not be uh out there right now because of the time moves on and uh uh, albums, the albums and stuff that we did back in the old days. I don't think they reprint uh, all of them, you know, all that kind of stuff. So uh, uh, I think most of the good performances are on our uh, on our Toto records. The fans, they they they. Uh, I was just looking at this a while ago. Uh, they just wish you well. I'll say it again, and that's, oh, so, that's nice. so nice. I mean, that's so nice. They're so good, big hearted. I can't. I just want to. I just want to hug everybody right now yeah. out there who's listening and say, uh, God bless you. And I love you. And uh, we're very grateful and I'm very grateful for your sentiments and your support. I remember when my sister was going through tough times uh, uh, health wise and everybody was, 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 they were praying for my sister and uh, uh, there was such great support out there. And, and uh, I did nothing, have nothing but love for all the total fans out there. I hope you enjoyed that. Forgotten Toys is the new EP from David Page. You can pick it up. There are links in the description where you can go to, it's just totalofficial.com, the Total website, and get more information on this fantastic piano player who's worked with so many great people. Remember, like our videos, subscribe to our channel, share our videos on social media, share this video on all the Toto sites, on Facebook. I'm John Bogan. This is Rock History Book. Mm -hmm.